Hello, everyone. Thanks for tuning back in once again, <clears throat> excuse me, to Authentic Black Goddess TV. I'm your host, Queen Amadai Shakur, and this is the second dose of your daily vitamins. So as you're coming in, please feel free to go ahead and subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. Be sure to click the notification bell and click the word all so that you're notified each time Queen Goddess goes live. Hello, Mo and Miko, Louise, Lee, Nessie, Prada Bentley, Ryan, Broken Silence is Black, Christine is in the house. All right. Hello, Pearly, Sweet Great Mom, Conscious Outlaw, Stacey, Patrick, everyone. Shout out to everyone in the chat. Hey, Vince, I am from the UK. I see you. Dark Skin Brother is Black, Aboriginal Woman 61, Asha Mwamba, Dark Child, Claudette, One Who Cares, Melanated Brown is Black, Tanaya. Don't need a man. Stop telling me I do. Overthoughts. Shout out to everyone in the chat and everyone tuned in to the queen. Please go ahead and give this video a like and a share if you could be so kind. Thank you. Now let's get into it, people. Hello, Christopher and Queen Candy J. Okay, now listen to this. A Tesla on autopilot killed two people in Gardenia. Now they ask, is the driver guilty of manslaughter? Didn't I tell y'all this would happen? Didn't I tell y'all this would happen? That they are doing too much. But anyway, so they say a Honda Civic pulled up to the intersection of the Artesia Boulevard and Vermont Avenue in Gardenia. Now, it was just after midnight. And the traffic light was green. As the car proceeded through the intersection, a Tesla Model S on autopilot exited a freeway, ran through a red light, and then crashed into the Civic. Now, the Civic's driver, Gilberto Alcazar Lopez, and his passenger, Maria Guadalupe Nieves Lopez, were killed instantly. Now, nearly two years later, prosecutors in Los Angeles County filed two counts of vehicular manslaughter against the driver of the Tesla, a 27-year-old Kevin George Aziz Riyadh. Now, experts believe in its first, it is the first felony prosecution in the United States of a driver who caused the fatality while using a partially automated driver assist system. As such, the case represents a milestone in the increasingly confused world of automated driving. They say it's a wake-up call for drivers. This is what Alon Kornhoster, the director of the self-driving car program at Princeton University, this is what he had to say. He said it certainly makes us all of a sudden not become so complacent in the use of these things that we forget about the fact that we're the ones that are responsible, not only for our own safety, but for the safety of others as well. Now, while automated capabilities are intended to assist drivers, systems with names like Autopilot, Super Cruise, and ProPilot can mislead consumers into believing the cars are capable of much more than they really are. This is what Kornhauser says. Yet even as fully autonomous cars are being tested on public roads, automakers, technology companies, organizations, and set engineering standards, or they set the engineering standards, uh, regulators and legislators have failed to make it clear to the public, and in some cases, one, uh, to even to one another, what the technical differences are, or who is subject to legal liability when people are injured or even killed. Now, Riyadh, a limousine service driver, has pleaded not guilty and is free on bail with the case still, still pending. His attorney did not respond to a request from comment as of Tuesday. Now, should Riyadh be found guilty? Well, it's going to send drive shivers up and down the spines of anyone who has these vehicles and then realizes, hey, I'm the one that's responsible. Just like when a when I was driving a 55 Chevy, this is what Kornhauser says. He says, I'm the one that's responsible for making sure that it stays between the white lines. Now, after the daily collision in Gardenia, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration opened an investigation into the crash to determine just what went wrong. Now, though the court documents filed in Los Angeles did not mention autopilot by name, the agency is expected to soon post findings reflecting the technology was engaged. They say a parade of similar probes in the years that followed have continued to question the safety and reliability of automated driving features, including a larger investigation into as many as 765,000 Tesla cars built between 2014 to 2021. So they say last year 
NHTSA ordered dozens of automobile and technology companies to report crash data on automated vehicles in order to better monitor their safety. No commercially available monitor or motor vehicle can completely drive itself. The eight, this is what the agency says. Now, Tesla's autopilot feature is classified as a level two vehicle autonomy, which means the vehicle can control steering and acceleration, but a human in the driver's seat can take control at any time. Well, that all is so crazy. I wouldn't be trusting a car to drive itself at all. Okay, that's just me. I also don't trust these robots and these robo dogs and all this crazy stuff that they're inventing, all this technology. It all can go awry. Okay, these things can clearly get viruses just like computers because after all, aren't they made of some type of software? I'm just saying. Oh, so anyway, um, Rose Gold says Tesla had big racial discrimination lawsuits. Really? I'm not surprised. Beatzilla said exactly. Okay, Conscious Allo said that just seems like a way to kill somebody, get in the car and then take over the electronics, and then it's a car crash accidentally. But maybe, and that, that is a good way to do it, huh? Uh, says it's, then it's a car crash accidentally, but maybe I'm just thinking too hard. No, that sounds about right. Terry Hinton says, Me neither, Queen. I don't trust this new technology. Me either. And Vince, I am from the UK, says foul play looks like it was hacked. Could have been. And that's another thing. These things absolutely have the ability to be hacked. So it's just all so crazy. All so crazy. And so anyway, now listen to this. University of Michigan. Well, they have a settlement for $490 million with sexual abuse accusers. And this must have been going on for years. The University of Michigan has agreed to pay $490 million in damages to more than 1,000 former students, mostly males, uh, who have been sexually abused by sports doctor Robert Anderson. This was confirmed by their attorneys on Wednesday. Now, the announcement comes 15 months after 15 months of mediation and appeared to close the book on one of the nation's biggest sex abuse scandals, which involved several generations of victims going back to the 1960s. They say it has been a long and challenging journey, and I believe this settlement will provide justice and healing for the many brave men and women who suffered and refused to be silenced. This is what Parker Stinner of the Denver-based law firm Wahlberg, Woodruff, Nemo, and Sloan, who represents dozens of the accused, this is what he had to say. Now, Stenner said some 1,050 at, uh, Anderson survivors will share the $490 million settlement money, uh, meaning that each accuser will receive an average of $438,000. $30 million of that money will be set aside for any future accusations. Now, Rick Fitzgerald, Associate Vice President of Public Affairs at the University of Michigan, confirmed the settlement. I'm going to share my screen so you all, you all can see uh, this brief clip of what one of the survivors had to say. Everyone, please get those likes up. Please like and share. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so. Thank you in advance. Like many others before and after me, I was ruthlessly, repeatedly, and regularly raped by Dr. Anderson at least 45 times. But I'm not here to speak about that today, about Anderson's abuse of hundreds or even thousands of students and athletes. I'm here to demand a call to immediate and specific action with transparency, accountability, and full investigation by the University of Michigan the leadership, the Board of Regents, the Big Ten Conference, and the NCAA. I speak today to University of Michigan students, parents, athletic sponsors, and boosters, investigative journalists, and most importantly, my Michigan man brothers and other survivors of the largest, most insidious conspiracy to cover up rape, sexual abuse, 
grooming and gaslighting of the truth in the history of sports. Today, we go from victims who suffered abuse to survivors who take action. What the University of Michigan did did not kill me. It was hellish experience, but I am alive. The naive teenager who was recruited to Ann Arbor in 1988, now standing here before you in 2021, is a man, a Michigan man. So Board of Regents, so the University of Michigan, say my name. Because the time is now for all of you who have been abused here to speak up for justice. We will speak. Because every victim matters. I matter. I am not John Doe. I am John Vaughn. Thank you. So nefarious people. <laughs> Beatsil said this is a real hashtag me too. Or shall we say he too? In this case, I'm just saying. All so nefarious. Fight for Black says so one doctor did all of this and nobody came forward and kicked this guy's ace. My sentiments exactly. I mean, talk about being buck broken. All so nefarious. All so nefarious. But anyway, I digress. And so listen to this, people. And this no good man admits to enslaving someone for 40 years. Listen to this. I'm waiting for it to load. Everyone, in the meantime, please get those likes up. Please a like and share. Hold on, let me try to get this up. Here we go. So man pleads guilty to exploiting a worker who lived in a garden shed for 40 years with no light or heating, according to UK authority. Mm, mm, mm. So a man has pleaded guilty to exploiting the, the worker for 40 years. Uh, Peter Swales, age, 40, age 56, was accused of keeping a man in an unlit garden shed without heating for decades. First of all, if this went on for 40 years and he's 56, you mean he was enslaving this man when he was 16 years old? Somebody had to be helping him. Anyway, uh, the man was forced to work for Swales and was paid about 10 pounds a day for his work. Now, a man in England pleaded guilty to slavery and trafficking offenses in connection with a worker who lived in a tiny shed without so much as a light or any heat for 40 years. Now, Peter Swallis, age 56, pleaded guilty on Tuesday to the charges related to keeping the man in a wooden shed in his garden for four decades, uh, according to a press release from the UK's Gang Masters and Labor Abuse Authority. The press release says that Swales was arrested in October of 2018 after the police searched the trailer park in Carlisle, Northwest England. Both Swales and his 81-year-old father, I knew he had to have some help on it, his low damn no good old ace daddy, said that he and his 81-year-old father, also named Peter Swales, were accused at the time of offenses under the UK's Modern Slavery Act. But the older Swallows died in September of 2021. Isn't that something? Died right before he could escape justice, no less. Now, he died before the trial began. Now, the Evening Standard reported that the authorities res rescued the man from the shed after an anonymous tip-off. The authorities found the man who was 58 years old at the time in a shed, a dark shed, that is, without lights and no source of heat. GLAA officers said that the shed was in complete darkness when they went to rescue the man. The worker who is now in his 60s told UK law enforcement that he spent his days working on farms, which included painting and slating uh, for the two Swales men for about 10 pounds, which equals to be about $13.60 per day. Officers from the GLA said another shed where the Swales family dog slept was in a far...
they said the authorities uh, said that another shed on the on the same property where the Swallis family dog slept was in a far better state and condition than the ones that they gave to the worker. Darn shame. I'm going to show you a picture of this shed in a minute. Uh, so they go on to say that the worker, the rescued worker is now living in government supported accommodation. And they say, this has been a really harrowing investigation. In all my years in law enforcement, I've never known a modern slavery case where the exploitation has taken over, taken place over such a long period of time. This is what Martin Pil Plimmer, a senior investigating officer, said to the press in a relief. He says, first and foremost, in my mind, at this time, though the victim, uh, though he's the victim, he says, let's remember that he has been exploited for all of his adult life up until just a few years ago. He is now in his early 60s. This is something that even now I struggle to even comprehend. For four decades, he was kept as a slave. And he goes on to say, we are sadly all too aware of the fact that he will be traumatized by his experience for the rest of his life. I am committed to ensuring he continues to have the regular consistent support that he needs that allows him to lead a normal life as he can in the circumstances. Let me show you all this shed where they had this man living. This is all so sad and nefarious. Misty says slavery never ended. It certainly didn't, beloved. It certainly didn't. Y'all see that? I mean, look at it. It's no room in there. Look at all this trash on the side. It just looks so ridiculous. This is the inside of it right there. And that was just so sad. First of all, um, somebody said, just being said that I just see a flat screen TV in there. Just Biz, please cut it out. You know good and darn well. You didn't see no darn flat screen in that little bitty old tiny shed. It probably wouldn't even hold one for one. And for two, there was no lighting or heat. So what was he going to do with a flat screen? Please cut it out. Now, Swirl Girl said, now I want to see what the slaveholder's house looks like. Mm. Fancy, I'm sure. That was just all so sad. I mean, like, the man who they did this to, he had to be, like, mentally, you know, um, 
you know, incapacitated or something, he had to be like a little slow because I can't just see somebody with all of their senses being held captive for all those times and not doing anything about it. I mean, there was a fork on the floor. He could have taken that fork and stabbed one of them and made a run for it or something, right? Honey, they wouldn't have had me in there for 40 years, I promise you. They wouldn't have had me in there for 40 minutes, let alone 40 years. I didn't the least. Mm. Say what now? <laughs> Our Negroes official said there was a TV monitor. Really? I didn't see it. Tracy said, Queen, I thought I saw a flat screen TV as well. <laughs> Maybe y'all did. I missed it. Where and who are his people? Who knows, honey? Who knows? Also said, I know that and clearly crazy. But anyway, let me continue. Everyone, please get those likes up. Please like and share. Now, everyone, every last one of you should be so glad and grateful and thankful and have an attitude of gratitude that y'all never had to go through such things. Mm -hmm. Should be so thankful. Because that could have been y'all living in that little small shed for four decades, honey. Could you imagine? And from the looks of it, it looked like they just fed him oatmeal and soda pop, something like that. Look crazy. Anyway, meanwhile, the dog was living good. Pay attention. Chinese basketball fans yelled racial slurs at former Toronto Raptors player Sonny Weems and told him to get his ace out of China. These people are something else. <laughs> hey, Shaliva, I said I would fight back. Uh, hey, Shaliva, we know you would, honey. We already know y'all won the revolution. So clearly, they wouldn't have two in there for them 40 years. Honey. That's what I know. <laughs> we already know the Haitians would have fought back with a fierceness. Okay? Please. Ah. Anyway, let me continue. <laughs> You all are so crazy. <laughs> Night Wolf called them Wuhan thugs. <laughs> Five of Black said I would have gone Hannibal Lecter on that captain. <laughs> Let me continue. I'm getting sidetracked. So a court... <laughs> A courtside scuffle between two Chinese basketball association players turned even uglier last week, honey, when fans shouted racial slurs and vulgarities at one of the athletes after the game. Now, American basketballer Sonny Wings, who plays for the Guangdong Southern Tigers, <laughs> was filmed exiting his team bus last Thursday as a small crowd chanted the N-word, telling him, F you and get out of China. <laughs> In the video, the 35-year-old athlete appears to flash a smile at the angry fans, prompting one of them to say, don't you give me a smile? Several giggles can be heard as Weems silently walks off camera. Now, on Friday, the CBA posted a statement on social media's platform, Weibo, saying that it firmly opposes and strongly condemns any form of racial discrimination. Yeah, right. Please pursue it, all of it. <laughs> now, the association also wrote in an open letter to basketball fans asking them to follow public order and good customs and resist vulgar words and deeds ahead of the Beijing 2020 winter, uh, 2022 Winter Olympics. It's not immediately clear why the fans in the video shouted at Weems. He and Han Bijun, a player from the Liaoning Flying Leopards, Leopards, clashed near the Southern Tigers bench on Thursday after Han fell to the floor guarding a drive from Wings in the third quarter. Zin Hua News reported this. What in the Crouching Tiger was going on, people? Now, while the referee watched the video replay to check for fouls, Han, reached, Han approached the Guangdong bench and punched Wings, who then retaliated per Zin Hua. 
The out reported that both players were sent off the court after being separated by the referee and their teammates. Now, according to Xinhua, Han was fined $31,440 and suspended for seven games, while Williams was fined $22,008 and suspended for five games. Williams hasn't publicly addressed his altercation with Han, nor the racism displayed toward him last Thursday, but he posted a series of heart-shaped emojis in, a various, in various colors that same day. Fans on Weibo expressed their support for the basketballer. They say, don't worry, we'll always support you. That's what one person wrote. Then somebody says, Brother Coon, please help us pass the word to him. Uh, this is what another person said to Wings. Brother Coon? They, they called him Brother Coon, but they spelled it K-U-E. And I don't know if that means something else or whatever, but they called him Brother Coon. Now they say the thousands and tens of thousands of Guangdong are supporting him. The fans at Lie Noing are notoriously rubbish. Let's ignore them. They're all mad dogs. <laughs> That's what someone from the UK said. Fellow ex-NBA player Jeremy Lin voiced his support for Wings on Weibo as well. He says, I've experienced myself just what it's like to be called a Chinaman in a place where I'm considered a foreigner. This is what uh, this is what the Beijing Ducks point guard who formerly played for the New York Knicks said. And to be honest, he says, it's scary when everyone around you doesn't look like you. The abuse Weems received really felt disrespectful. The, that word carried so much hurt, unfairness, and hatred that I couldn't put it into words, Lynn said. Now, the Chicago Bulls picked Weems in the 2008 NBA draft, and he spent several seasons with the Denver Nuggets, also the Toronto Raptors, Philadelphia 76ers, and Phoenix Suns. After a few years in the Euro League and with the Chinese team Zhejiang Golden Bulls, he joined the Southern Tigers in 2018 and won three consecutive CBA championships. Now, the shooting guard and small forward spoke out in the past against hateful behavior toward Asians, tweeting his condolences to all of my Asian brothers and sisters in 2021. He was a coon. Now I see why they call him brother coon. Clearly a coon, okay? You sitting there defending them while they call you the N-word and tell you to get your black ace out of time. Isn't that something? Talking about his Asian brothers and sisters. Okay, well, where were they when you were getting your behind kicked? and being called the N-word. I'm just wondering. I'm just wondering. Anyway. Oh, so crazy. So, with that all being said, <laughs> with that all being said, everyone, please like and share this video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. Be sure to click the notification bell and click the word all. Now, we have one more video. I'm going to be on the uh, original Queen Amadad Shakur channel. We have to talk about this rapper, Hitman Holla, who said that the doctor was clearly being racist and laughing at his girlfriend who was shot in the face at the hospital. He did a video about him talking smack. Okay, so we're going to talk about that. Also, a Cobb County, Georgia family is suing because they want answers as to why their son was killed by the Cobb County racist police. All right. And so that all being said, I hope to see you all in the next chat starting immediately following this live. Please like and share. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Queen Amadai Shakur. Please also follow the Queen Amadai Shakur fan page and you can catch me on Twitter at DGoddess27.